Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob. I'm one of two extension specialists at the University of Kentucky. The second one is Dr. Anthony Pescatore, also goes by Tony. Um, we've been putting on this uh, month weekly webinar related to purebred breeding of chickens. Um, we had a request for this after we did a series of webinars uh, last year. And so this is the follow up to the request that we had. So uh, it's a series. This is the last one in the series. And Dr. Pescatori will be uh, giving the presentation. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat box and the Q&A. So if you have a question at any time um, during the webinar, feel free to type it in the chat box or the Q&A. If it is a clarification of what Dr. Pescatori is talking about at the time, I will pop up, otherwise I'll be muted, um, to ask for the clarification. Uh, otherwise, we'll hold the questions to the end. But if you're like me and you think of a question, you got to put it down before you forget it. So um, feel free to type it in when, when you think about it. So. Um, it's all yours, Tony. I'm going to be on mute. And uh, as I said, if there is a question, I will pop up and ask. And thank you, Jackie. As Dr. Jacob said, well, this is part of the webinar series we had on breeding uh, purebred chickens. Uh, the other previous webinars were an introduction to poultry genetics, uh, genetics of various chicken traits, such as comb, feathers on legs, plumage. Then the third one was on breeding programs and selecting breeders. All the webinars are recorded and are posted on our YouTube to, uh, uh, channel. And Dr. Jacobs will put that in the, uh, in the uh, chat box as well as uh, what's on the screen. So tonight we're gonna talk about incubation and operating a hatchery in Kentucky. So I want to go over a few things as we talk about this and talk about not only the incubation process, the hatcheries, the do's and don'ts that occur with it, and how it fits, uh, fits into your breeder program. So if you look at this graph, uh, you can see the multicolored lines. Those are heritage breeds that have not been selected for egg production. And then there is a commercial bird that's been selected for egg production. And you can see the, the improvement on production that simple genetics have played on. It's more even more prominent when you look at those same breeds that have not been selected for egg weight and a commercial strain that's uh, are selected for egg weight. So we are able to make genetic progress on certain traits very easily and we need our and the more complex traits as well. In order to with a chicken or any of the poultry, we can make rapid change in chickens because of a few things. One is that the generation in interval is, is relatively short. It's 24 weeks from the time you have a chick to the time you produce that chicken, that that chicken can produce its own chick. So it's a 24 week generation interval. Next thing that happens is we can get multiple individuals from one bird. So per hen, we get multiple individuals over time. And then the other one is there's no need for maternal offspring interaction. So with mammals that are tr you're trying to breed, you have to have that period of time where the, the litter is, is with the mother. Because the uh, poultry are precocious animals, they can be raised separate from the maternal and that bird can continue making uh, new generations. And one of the ways that we make that change is by having selection press, uh, pressure on the population. So in this diagram, you see flock A and flock B. The selection pre pressure on, on flock A is about 20%. The selection pressure uh, on flock B is about 10%. 
So by putting more selection on that population or being more refined on what we're looking for, we can make a headway on a specific trait. But for us to make genetic improvement, the one thing that was the things we need is one, it has to be a measurable trait, whether it's visual or whether it's actual measurement of say body weight or livability or whatever it is, it's measurable that we know that trait is being passed on. The trait has to breed true as well so that it is a trait we can identify. And in order to make progress, we have to make sure there's no adverse traits that come along with it. So an example would be if we select it for body weight, we might individual inadvertently select for poor egg production. In order to put pro, uh, selection pressure on any type of trait, we need a population that's large enough to give us eggs so that we can select the trait we desire. Not only that, we need a large enough group of offspring to apply that selection pressure. And, as, and also we need males and females from that population in order to make improvement. So those are the type of things we have to do in order to make genetic improvement. So that's why we get to incubation and hatchery management. We have to have a population of offsprings that we can select the desirable trait. So I wanna go over with you some terminology we'll be using tonight when we start talking about uh, hatching and incubation. The word hatchery refers to the building that is used to incubate and hatch eggs of egg laying species. So it's the physical building. A hatchery can also be part of a building. It may be your basement. Incubate means to provide heat, ventilation, humidity, and turning of fertilized eggs to develop an embryo. So when we incubate eggs, we're trying to take the place of the mother hen. The incubator, or we can also refer to as the setter, is a mechanical device that's used to in incubate eggs. That'll provide ventilation, humidity, turning of the eggs. The setter in regards to the uh, chickens, are the incubators we use for the first 18 days. The last three days, the eggs are in a hatcher. It's a mechanical device that the eggs are placed in during those last three days of incubation in order to hatch. The one big difference is there's no turning of the eggs in the hatcher. So like for chicken, it's 18 days and three days. For a turkey where the incubation period is 28 days, it's 25 and still three days. And a hatching egg is an egg that's produced, it is produced to create a new individual. So a hatching egg has to have the male and female present in order for fertilization. A fertile egg is an egg that contains the de developing embryo. So the fertile eggs have to be have the embryo in it so that we can make it a hatching egg. Infertile eggs are eggs that only contain the, the female gamete. And then we use terms like setting and pipping. Placing the egg in the incubator is what's called setting or set a set. Uh, it also refers to a group of eggs placed in the incubator at the same time. And then pipping is the act of the chick penetrating the shell membranes and the shell to break out of the, of the eggs. So those are the type of terms we're going to that have specific meanings as we progress this evening. So let's start with what we really need to. In order to be uh, an effective hatchery or effective incubation, we have to start out with settable eggs eggs that are fertile, that are clean, what are, that are sound, and that are egg-shaped. Most of the incubators have their way of holding the egg that's based on an egg shape. 
And when we talk about egg shape, it's an ovoid, which means it's got a large end and a small end, and it tapers from the large end to the small end. So that's what a settable egg is. It's fertile, it's clean, it's sound, and it's egg shaped. Eggs that are unsuitable for hatching are dirty eggs, cracked eggs. We don't want any small eggs because we'll find out later how the size of the egg influences the size of the chick. We don't want very large eggs or double yolk eggs. Double yolk eggs may have developing embryos in them, but the two embryos will get in each other's way when it's time for pipping. We don't want any poor shells because poor shells will lose a lot of moisture in a hurry. And we don't want grossly misshapen eggs because they don't fit in the system that's designed to hold an egg shape. So when we talk about a hatchery, what are we talking about? We're talking about whether it's a small, uh, a large hatchery or just a uh, in-home hatchery, what we're talking about is having specific parts that we have to have. One, we have to have a place to bring the eggs into. We have to have a place to store the eggs. We have to have our setters and our, hatchery, our hatchers there. We have to have a place that we can process the chicks after they're hatched. And we have to, if we're going to sell chicks, what are we going to, how and we're going to ship chicks, we have to have an area where we have the ability to ship out of. In addition, we need support areas. We need areas where we have dry storage, whether we're storing egg flats or, or chick boxes or any of the things that we need, chemicals and things like that. We are also very important is sanitation. So we have to have a tray washing area. And we have to have some way of handling the hatchery waste. So those are the parts of a hatchery, no matter what size you are or, or, or how big you are, you have to have a way of dealing with each one of those components as you move forward. So the four things that an incubator provides is the correct temperature, the correct humidity. It allows gas exchange, so we have to have ventilation, and we have to have regular turning of the eggs. The temperature itself is usually around 99 to 100 degrees. Humidity is about 60 to 70 percent. The gas exchange as an embryo develops, it's going to give off carbon dioxide and it's going to require oxygen. So we're gonna have an exchange of gas. As I always say in an egg, it, the hen puts everything for a new individual except one thing and that one thing is oxygen. And then we turn the eggs to keep the eggs rotating so they do not set or do not stick to, any, uh, to the side of the egg. So even the hen, when she's sitting on a nest, will turn the eggs. Anytime we talk about incubation and hatcheries, we have to talk about sanitation. The reason for that is that the temperature and the humidity of an incubator are ideal for not only growing and developing the chick, it's also ideal for growing bacteria and microorganisms. So we have to pay attention to sanitation or you'll wind up in trouble. You also need to organize your operation from clean areas to dirty areas. So clean areas are areas where say egg storage, a, uh, the, the setters. Then once we move into the hatching area, there we have the hatcher, we have the tray washing, we have the chicks themselves are all the, uh, the dirty area. So we want to segregate those areas and always move from the, the uh, clean to the dirty area. One of the things that's really important is we need to make sure no matter what, 
whether you're small or large, that you clean and disinfect after every hatch. That hatcher and those where the and the room where the hatcher is needs to be cleaned, including the down and any of the hatchery waste. And the, the hatcher has to be disinfected to prevent harmful bacteria microorganisms and growth. If you do not do that, as each hatch progresses, you will have a buildup of microorganisms in there and eventually will have uh, some serious disease problems. With that in mind, one of the things I will say is that one of the things I always recommend is to use a separate setter and hatcher. No matter what size you are, use something that is a setter and a hatcher. Have two distinct things because that setter will not get as dirty as the hatcher. So all some of these incubators come as all in one with a setter and a hatcher. They're extremely difficult to clean. It doesn't allow you to clean the hatcher between hatches if you have multiple sets. So one of the things I hope you get away from this night is that you do, if uh, unless you're only doing a small batch of eggs, having a, a, a setter and a hatcher that are separate is ideal. So let's look at the embryo. And when we talk about the embryo itself, people always think about it has to provide heat. So one of the things we have to know about that embryo, as it develops, it switches from, some, from an organism that needs heat to an organism that needs to get rid of heat. So one of the things that's important is we know that we have to have the ability to regulate temperature because they just don't need heat. At some point they switch over and they are producing more heat than they need. So it's really important that we understand that towards the end of the, the hatch or end of development, that chick begins to produce heat. So that's why having a separate hatcher and a separate uh, setter also is ideal because you can set your temperatures and be independent. This is also important to realize is that if you use multiple ages in your setter, that some of the eggs are gonna require heat, some of the eggs are gonna be giving off heat and it bounds itself out a little bit and doesn't require as much auxiliary heat. Another thing that happens during incubation is that the embryo or the egg will lose weight. And that weight that it loses is water mo is moisture that is evaporated out of the egg. While that egg may look solid, it has many pores that are there for gas exchange and also for water loss. Ideally, when we're incubating eggs, we're shooting for about 11% weight loss of that egg. And that is, most, that is water loss that we have through the shell. And it's a slow, nice, gradual process. If you lose too much uh, of water or too little water, we can have problems. That's why we said back there, we want proper egg shells because if they're very thin, they will lose much more weight by water loss. So let's think about this embryo. In 21 days, that chicken embryo is going to go from a gamete or two gametes all the way to a developed chick. So in that period, there are, are important periods that we have to make sure we meet the needs of the embryo. So before the egg is laid, Fertilization, this is on the uh, left-hand side, is the reproductive tract of a hen. It has the oviduct and the, uh, the yolks up top are the ovary. And the ovum, the egg yolk or the ovum will ovulate and be caught in by the first part of the reproductive tract, the infundibulum. It'll pull in that egg or that yolk and that is where fertilization takes place. The sperm uh, penetrates the ovum up there. It forms a zygote and it occurs about 15 minutes of ovulation. 
So the egg has already been fertilized when it's at the top of the reproductive tract. It's going to now take somewhere between 20 and 24 hours to move through that tract. As it moves through the tract, that's a perfect environment. The internal temperature of that hen is about 104 to 107 degrees. That embryo is starting to develop. By the time it gets down to the isthmus, which puts the shell membranes on, you, you're at an H cells, uh, uh, eight cells uh, or blastoderm of the embryo. So that egg is already developing in that oviduct. And it's going to be in that shell gland almost 20 or more than 20 hours. You're going to have about 256 cells. So by the time that egg is laid, that embryo has, uh, has three distinct layers of cells. It's an embryo. So you think to yourself, hey, that embryo started to develop. So doesn't it continue to develop once the egg is laid? Well, in nature, they figured that out. And we have what's called physiological zero. Once that egg is laid to the outside environment and the temperature is under 70 degrees, the embryonic development stops. It goes into a, a physiological zero. It, it stops developing. And if we hold that egg at that temperature, it'll continue to be suspended in development. This is one of the reasons why we can collect a group of eggs and store them together and set them all at one time and develop a flock, uh, uh, have a flock or a large group hatch at the same time. So with that, that leads into the fact that we have, are able to store hatching eggs. The optimum temperature to store hatching eggs is actually between uh, under 60 degrees, somewhere between 52 and 59 would be optimum. With that said, a food refrigerator is way too cold to store hatching eggs. You're better off just storing them in a cool part of a basement or a garage that's cool than to put them in the refrigerator. Humidity wise, you wanna be at least 75% humidity so they don't have a lot of egg uh, water waste. But when we sit there and we have the egg been cooled, if we were to put that egg directly into an incubator, one of the things that would happen is the eggs would sweat. Much like uh, your, if you wear glasses, you come into a building and uh, you've been outside in this winter and you walk in and the first thing is your glasses fog up or you get in the car and your windshield fogs up, that condensation on the eggshell is not good because it will, uh, it can uh, penetrate, have bacteria on it and cause uh, problems with the uh, eggs. And it happens because cold eggs are suddenly exposed to high environmental temperatures. So what we are recommending to you is that if you are storing your eggs in a cold and a cool environment, that you always bring your eggs up to room temperature before you put them in the incubators for a short period of time, bring them up so that they're pre-warm before you put them in the incubator. But we can store eggs and that's not a, uh, that's not a large issue. However, when we start storing eggs, we start losing hatchability. So one of the things you gotta remember that on average for every one day of storage, we increase incubation time by one hour. For every one day of storage, we increase incubation time by one hour. And 
they all, since that is true, one of the things we do want to emphasize to you, if you're hatching eggs, you don't want to store, set fresh eggs and stored eggs at the same time, set them as two different groups or on two different days because they're going to hatch at two different times. If you have prolonged storage, which you may have uh, if you're doing purebreds where you're trying to get a large group of birds together and you have a small population of breeders, if, if you have more than six days of storage, you'll lose between a half a percentage and a one and a half percent per day with the increase, the increase of storage past six days. We also find that body weights can be depressed in a chicks from eggs that are stored more than 14 days. So that chick quality is affected and their body weight is affected if you store the eggs too long. As I said before, you wanna bring your eggs up to uh, temperature slowly, slowly bring the eggs to room temperature, then put them in your incubator. So as we're talking about that chick, there are times as we develop that embryo where there are peak periods of mortality. There are critical points in that incubation period. Now, during the first few days, at that point, for proper formation, you have the, all the extra embryonic membranes, all the membranes in the egg have to be developed that all the systems in the egg have to be developed. So we have by three days of incubation, a peak of mortality. If something has gone wrong where all the systems are not started, that chick will not develop any further. So we have a peak of mortality at three days. We have a peak of mortality that's a smaller peak at 14 days because at 14 days, the embryo changes from being horizontal in the egg to vertical in the egg. She's getting into, into position in order to hatch by breaking out of at the large end of the egg. So you have that peak of mortality at 14 days if that chick has not uh, orientated itself inside the egg. So as an example, here's some co uh, common, uh, it, what we want the chick to be in normal hatching pos position is the head under the right wing pointing towards the air cell. Anytime she's out of position, she will not be able to find the air cell and switch to uh, outside hair. So that is our third peak of mortality at day 19, when she fails to make the transition from her embryonic or altoic uh, respiration to normal pulmonary respiration. When she's taken her first breath of the embryos, taking their first breath of fresh of air with her lungs. So we have those three points of mortality. The first three days, the day 14, and day 19. So as we're managing the hatchery, one of the things we have to be aware of is that things that happen in your breeding pens or in your farm influences the hatchability of those eggs. So in order to get hatching eggs that are going to be successful in, in, in hatching, we have to be aware of what our breeder flock looks like. We have to make sure that the birds are on good breeder nutrition. As I said before, everything that the developing chick needs to develop has to be in the egg at the time it's laid other than oxygen. So any, any vitamin, any mineral, any pro, the sources of protein, the sources of energy, and its water source all have to be in that egg. So you have to feed a good 
level of nutrition to your breeders. We also have diseases that can influence hatchability. Such as some, some of the respiratory diseases will impact the shells of eggs or impact the, uh, the embryo itself. Or bacterial infections can do the same thing. We also can be influenced by the mating activity. In order to have fertile eggs, we have to have males that are producing semen. We have to have that semen transferred through mating to the hen. That hen has to make sure that semen gets up to the egg and gets fertilized. In order to do that, we have to have accurate mating activity. And then how we take care of that egg. If we got to have clean nest, we have to make sure the eggs are not damaged. We want to make sure the eggs are clean and that they're stored properly. But we can also change hatchability uh, by the way we manage our incubators and our hatchery. Poor sanitation will be the problem. Egg storage at, as you're waiting to put them in the, the incubators. Egg damage. The management of the incubators. All these incubators have uh, different types of control systems. We have some really good digital control systems. We have some manual control systems that whatever you're using, make sure you're managing that center and that hatcher at the proper temperature and making sure that the humidity is right. Egg sanitation is very, uh, very important. Clean eggs are very important if you're going to wash. We really don't like the idea of washing, hatching eggs because it can, if you improperly wash them, it can drive the bacteria or you know, organisms through the pores into the egg. However, you, if you have some valuable birds and you want to use them and they are dirty, we recommend uh, using some type of sandpaper or scrub pad to get that dirt off. And then I always same thing is how do we handle those chicks and, and uh, once they're hatched. There is many different things that affect our time of hatching. So if you think about that chick, we say there's a magical 21 days. But really that chick is going to come out somewhere between 20 and a half days and 21 and a half days. And we can influence it by different things. One is if we spend too much time preheating the eggs and they get too hot, they'll develop early. If you set them too early in the day, they'll, have, they'll, they'll be hatched early or if you have too many hours of incubation. Incorrect setter and hatching temperatures. If, you, if, it, if it's running too hot, it'll speed up the hatch and, and if the humidity is wrong. Speeding up the hatch is not a good thing because you, you, the chick may not fully heal its navel if it's hatching too soon. Another thing we check in on the big incubators, the, we want to take temperatures in multiple places because there can be hot spots in a set or a hatch, or we may uh, overload the, the incubators or the hatchers and not be able to uh, provide the right temperature. Most places have uh, it cooling, but seasonal temperatures can have effect because those eggs are out in the, uh, in the yard and it's 90 degrees, they're not at physical zero yet. So it may be a little more development than we usually see. Again, if we put too many fertile eggs in that hatcher, we'll overload it and it'll be too, ha it'll be too hard to regulate. It. And then even egg size uh, affects it. We can also delay egg uh, a hatches. If we set too late in the day, we can have uh, too short a time, incorrect temperature. The cold, if we go too cold or cool, it'll, it'll extend the day. If we have incorrect ventilation, it'll slow things down because you don't have that cooling. If it's cold weather, we might be having a hard time regulating the incubator. 
Anytime we store eggs for extended periods of time, we're going to add on or delay hatching. And if we operate at too low a temperature. And if you have in, uh, multi-stage uh, stage, uh, machines where you put multiple size ages in there, if you put in too many in, of one uh, age of the egg in the incubator in a specific location and another in another, if you're incorrect set, setting pattern, you will have hot spots. And then things like fertility problems and disease can cause your, your uh, extended hatch. Anytime we're dealing where we're trying to produce chicks for a breeding purpose, we want to be able to make sure we get the proper size chicks. And egg size is the main factor affecting chick size. The chick weight is normally oh, approximately 65% or 66 to 68% of chick weight. So if you're trying to do a specific breed and you're talking about confirmation or you're talking about size and trying to do something of that nature, it's always good to pre-select your eggs the same weight so that when you do have a group of chicks, they all started out close in weight as opposed to having pullet eggs that are small and then maybe some large eggs and then having a population of varying chick size. Chicks from eggs that are averaging 60 grams will average around 40 grams. That's probably where you want and individual check weights, weights can range from 34 to 46 for regular chickens, not a standard chickens as opposed to bantams. And the egg weight decreases because of weight loss during incubation. So if we're losing more weight loss, water loss, you're going to have different a variation in chick weight. Anytime we keep the uh, egg, the, uh, the time we, the egg stays in the hatcher, the greater that is, uh, uh, the the the, uh, the smaller the chick will because they're going to lose weight as well. So we need to make sure we process those chicks, get them where they need to be. Now, if we're breeding and you have populations of chicks that you want to keep, it's very important that we segregate those birds and keep an ID on those eggs that you want to segregate. Well, if you're going to uh, mark eggs, I recommend you use a simple number two pencil and write on the small end of the egg because the large end of the egg will be destroyed when the chick hatches out of it, you may lose your ID numbers. But if you write on the small end of the egg or on the middle of the end of the egg, that's where you can put your identification. I don't advise using felt tip markers or ink or pens because a lot of times in that high humidity, those types of markings will be, uh, uh, will run. But these are hatching baskets that allows us to have multiple populations segregated so we know where the eggs are and who they're from. And that's really important as you're in a breeding program that you have good records. You need to make sure you understand where the eggs came from, that you have them identified, and that you are sure of when they hatch that those are the chicks you, that were produced from that mating. So here's just some hatching baskets at the bottom. We have a large hatching basket that we put in a uh, divider we made and then put uh, the uh, plastic tops on them. So that's one of the things we, uh, I encourage you to do is if you're going to try to hatch purebred birds, you want to make sure you're equipped to segregate the eggs and keep the identity of the chicks and the eggs.
So let's talk about different things. Here's an example of a setter. If you notice the eggs are in trays, you can see that the trays rotate 45 degrees. You can see there's a control panel up top that's, that monitors the temperature, the humidity, and, the re and, the, and regulates the, uh, the turning of the egg. This machine will do everything that the mother hen will do. As opposed to a hatcher, the big thing is you see that it's stationary racks as opposed to the turning racks. The baskets will go in there. You can see in the back, there's a fan for ventilation. We have the same controls on top. So we're basically, uh, when we move from the setter to the hatcher, the rule of thumb is, is to lower the temperature by a degree and raise the humidity by about 5%. So as we move forward, as we operate a hatchery, the scale of production makes a big difference. There's many different incubators on the markets. If you're hatching a small number of eggs, for your own use, you may be able to use tabletop uh, incubators that are out there. The, the important thing is make sure it's something that has good control, no matter what size incubator you are, and make sure it's cleanable, that it's washable, or it's be able to wipe out, be wiped out. You can buy some that do not have turners, so you have to ma manually turn the eggs. A good way of doing that is putting an X on the bottom of the egg, on one side of the egg, and make all the X's come up at one time. And you want to turn the eggs about four times a day. Here's an example of some larger ones. If you're getting into the business to sell chicks, is to make sure that the uh, you have good controls and uh, a good operation. Uh, here's an example of uh, one that you can find someone use. It, this incubator will hold about 900 chicken eggs or 720 turkey or duck eggs, uh, 2,500 quail eggs as well. Uh, but it does. It, it's it's a more mo it's a more a medium size incubator. Is a large incubator, holds much more uh, larger eggs, 2,000 chicken eggs. And here's one that's about 14,000. As you get into this size operation, you need to make sure you have uh, a hatchery that's well designed with all the separate parts in it. So hopefully if everything goes well, we have that chick hatching at 21 days. It's very important to remember that we that when they pip that shell, they're going to be switching to vent, their nat, the normal vent respiration. When they come out of that egg, they are wet. They are going to uh, be tired. They take a nap. They dry out. And an important thing occurs just prior to them coming out of that egg. They th will take their yolk sac and absorb it into their body. And the hole that they were in, that was allowed that to happen is their navel and they will heal their navel. The fact that they brought the remainder of their yolk inside their body cavity allows the chicks to be shipped over, through the mail or uh, long distances for, uh, and do, they don't need food or water for two or three days. Anytime we get to that point, we, we want to make sure we get the healthy chicks away. We want to dispose of unhatched eggs, eggshells, or deformed chicks. It's a good time to do a quick selection of birds that you know are, if you see things like cross beaks or, or bad eyes, or the birds have some misshapen feet or uh, legs, that's a great time to do that selection. If you're running your own hatchery and you're getting to this point, we have to, you have to think about the sexing of the birds, 
your breed, you know, you might have some breeders that are feather sexable that we talked about in one of the other lectures, or we can have a line like the black sex link where we can sex them by color, or we can have vent sexing. Vent sexing is very hard to do. Uh, I will guarantee 50% accuracy if I have to do it because it's very difficult. Uh, but if you are not going to be able to sex them, you're going to sell them as straight run. At the time, if you're selling chicks or you're producing your own, you may want to vaccinate chicks. Uh, for us, the things we recommend is the va vaccinate them for Merricks. Or we, if you're doing organics and you're producing chicks, you may want to do a coccidiosis vaccine. Either way, one of the things people get a, a uh, hang up about is when you go to buy vaccine for poultry, uh, for especially in small, quant uh, small flocks, the vaccines are sold in large quantities. Don't let the number of doses bother you. Look at the cost of the vaccine. So if you're sitting there and that's a, a cost of your operation, plan on spending that money, even though it's a 10, 000, it may be a thousand, 10,000 dosage. How much is it costing you to vaccinate each chick? And is it worth it to you? Same with coccidiosis. So don't let the dosage number bother you as much as figuring out what your cost for vaccination of each chick is. And as we move forward, one of the things is you got to understand your measure of success. So we need to monitor how good we are. Well, one of the measures we want to measure, and especially if you're doing some propagation that we want to, you want, you want to make sure your male is working, that the female is being receptive. One of the things to do is look at percent fertility. This is influenced by what's happening at the farm. So you take the number of eggs you set and you take, you need to know the number of fertile eggs. So you take the number of fertile eggs and divide it by the number of eggs you set times a hundred and that gives you a percentage. So we want to be a very high percentage of fertile eggs. Percent hatch is the number of eggs that hatched divided by the number of eggs you set. This gives you an overall measurement of your overall success. But if we want to know how good a job we're doing at the hatchery, we need to do what is called a percent hatch of fertile eggs, which is the number of eggs hatched divided by the number of fertile eggs. This gives you what is happening in the uh, incubator. So as an example, if we have 100 eggs placed in an incubator, 90 of the eggs are fertile, 70 eggs hatch, the percent fertility is 90 divided by 100, 90 fertile eggs divided by 100 eggs in the incubator, which comes out to 90%. We want to look at percent hatch. We take 70 that hatch divided by the 100 we set, and we have a 70% hatch. Now, the next one is the percent of ha hatch of fertile eggs, where we take that 70 of the chick eggs that hatch divided by 90 eggs that were fertile, and that shows us that our hatch of fertile eggs is 77.7%. These are the type of numbers that you need in order to measure your success. When we sit there, we can look inside those eggs and candle them. And we can do that successfully at 10 days of incubation, particularly with some of the breeds that lay very dark brown eggs. So 10 days of incubation, we can use a simple candling light, or we can use a mag flashlight or an LED flashlight. Look inside, by 10 days of age, you should see solid development. 
We also can candle when we transfer from the, hat, the setter to the hatcher. So if any embryos died, that would be time to remove them. We want to remove the infertile eggs and we want to meet and remove the early dead when we do it at 10 days. And we want to move and remove any of the other dead animal, uh, embryos at 14 at time of transfer at 18 days. And if we want a good handle on what we're doing, we need to open the unhatched eggs to determine what stage of incubation it was when the embryo, um, embryo mortality occurred. This is a useful tool on figuring out if we have a hatchability problem or a fertility problem and identifying areas where we can improve our hatch. So this is an example of recording how many uh, eggs that have uh, uh, the, the, the record we would keep and staging the embryos at different things. So if you sit there and you have a egg break analysis, it'll tell you different things. But if you go to the University of California, they have a very good publication on egg candling and breakout analysis. It gives you a record of what you're doing and trying to identify areas of importance. The last thing I wanna close with is the National Poultry Improvement Plan. This is a national plan that's a cooperation of the industry, the state and federal programs. It's been in existence since 1930 and it's an effective way of it was a way of controlling uh, hatchery disseminated the, the uh, diseases. It's been expanded to include other diseases as well. And MPAI uh, eliminated, uh, helps eliminate uh, pylorum disease, which is salmonella pylorum. The program is based on testing and monitoring of the birds so that they can select uh, to make sure the disease doesn't occur. The program currently offers testing and monitoring for Salmonella pylorum, which is the base program, Salmonella gallinarium or flor, flor, uh, flor, uh, foul typhoid, and Salmonella pylorum and gallinarium are combined in the, 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 the Salmonella test. It also does uh, mycoplasma gallicepticum and mycoplasma synovi for uh, chickens and turkeys. In turkeys, they also have another disease, mycoplasma malagaragus, and they also look at avian influenza. So most states, if you're selling out, in, that are selling chicks in Kentucky, if you're bringing outside shipments, they are required to have an MPI certificate to enter the state or a, uh, can come in on a veterinary inspection. Uh, and if you're selling to other states, they require uh, MPIP certificates in most cases. Some states in particular, the states like Missouri, uh, Georgia, West Virginia require an additional certification or a, a registration to bring birds into their state. Iowa would be another one. And states uh, require their, uh, many states require that their breeder flocks are in order to ship eggs and to, uh, are tested for avian influenza. So the MPIP program is a, hat, is a, a program that a hatchery or a breeder flock can sign up for and they will monitor their flocks, monitor their hatcheries, and uh, have a uh, birds that are in those programs. For small flocks, the MPIP program is monitored by the state veterinarian's office. The Kentucky Poultry Federation does it for the commercial industry, but for small flocks, you would contact the state veterinarian's office Particularly there, you have uh, Megan Zinner's uh, email and her phone number. She's the person that runs the program. So if you're trying to get into the commercial business or you're trying to 
exhibit birds, you need to get your birds tested by the state veterinarian's office <clears throat> and become a member of the National Poultry Improvement Plan. With that, I'll stop and uh, we'll uh, go on to any questions that are there. Okay, we had a few. The first one was, uh, what is a good disinfectant for cleaning the hatchery, the, the incubator and setter? I mean, uh, it's, if you look on the labels, there's, there's products like Pictrol and things like that. You want something that is not only a bacteria, uh, that kills bacteria and fungus, but you also want to find one that is viral. So that kills viruses. So you want a virus site is all. Tectrol is an example of one that would be the name. If you go into buy a look online or look in your farm stores, there are many different types in, of uh, disinfectants there. But get one that kills all three things, funguses, bacteria, and viruses. Okay, and we had a question on euthanasia for deformed chicks without PETA giving you a bad time. Uh, carbon dioxide is probably the best choice. You make a little chamber and have a small tank of carbon dioxide and use that as a way to uh, painful, painlessly do that. Or simple cerv cervical dislocation especially on baby chicks, I would use the, uh, it, you can use the back end of a scissors to act like a uh, way of, of dislocating the bird. But if I was doing lots of chicks, I would get a small tank of CO2 and a chamber that you can pump the CO2 into. Um, would Lysol work for cleaning? Lysol would work. Uh, it does have more odor than that. You, I, I don't know exactly on the, the uh, reading on the label. I don't know if it's a, a viral side. Uh, and somebody asked about the sexing failed chicks. They obviously didn't hear what you said about uh, it. It's very difficult to do vent sexing and you have to have the right gene, the right gene crosses in order to do feather sexing. But you can, if you're producing layers or something like that for sale, you can do the black sex link pretty easily. Yeah, there are some that are sex link crosses. There are um, some that are auto sexing breeds. So if you're hatching some of the auto sexing breeds, they, it is a feather sexing, but it's part of, I mean, it is a sex link cross, but it, it is sex linked, but it's not a cross. It's something specific of the breed right. for auto sexing. Um, for some, if you're trained, you have to be trained on how to do it. But vent sexing, you would, if you had large numbers, you would have to hire somebody right. to come in that's trained. Otherwise, you could damage the the birds. So right, very rough on the birds if it's done improperly. Yeah, it takes a lot to know how to do it, so. Uh, and then there was someone who asked about eggs up or down, so. What? Uh, eggs placed up, large end up or down. Well, uh, eggs are placed large end up. Yeah, um, and I do remember one time I was um, visiting somebody who was hatching eggs and getting very bad um, production or hatchability and her problem was that she heard you had to turn the eggs. So instead of understanding that it just goes on that 45 degree back and forth, she was taking the eggs and turning them from large end up to large end down and then large end. <laughs> so she was yeah. not getting a very good uh, hatch. Uh, where are the rules and regulations for hatcheries in Kentucky published? Uh, you get them through the uh, the state veterinarian's office. They're the contact for this. They will test your breeder flocks. They will also uh, help you establish your uh, hatchery as MPIP approved. They will. The, uh, the, uh, there is on the books in the state that there is a hatchery uh, permit. Uh, they don't enforce that because it costs more to issue the permit than the $25 
that it costs for you to have it. But talk to the state veterinarian's office. If you're getting into a large hatchery, you want to get it registered and want to be on the MPIP program. I would imagine you would also want to talk to environmental for disposal of uh, wash water and um, debris, you know, the, the wastage. The wastage, any of that, you can easily go into compost without any problem. The wastewater is not that uh, the water. They just go into sewage, right? They can go into a, a, into a wastewater system. Got to be really careful if you're using a lot of disinfectant. If you send it into your uh, septic system, you can kill off your good bacteria. Yeah, that'd be a problem. Yeah. Uh, anything now, else? The other thing is when you're talking about adding water to any of these things, uh, it's best to make sure you have a potable water source or a distilled water source will keep you from building up uh, calcium or, or uh, iron deposits on your machinery. I know even with some of those small tabletop ones, they get a better hatch when they use distilled water yeah. for the humidity rather than tap water because it, it's got too many um, stuff, too much stuff in it. Well, it's so. got chlorine in the tap water. You got no, they, they had, I guess it was hard water, I guess, and it yeah. was causing too much trouble. So any other questions? We have a few more minutes if you would like to ask a question. As I said, this was the last of the four uh, series that we did on, um, it, on breeding. So the genetics and stuff we talked about uh, earlier, uh, they were recorded. I posted that in the chat box for, for where it is. I posted the egg candling and breakout analysis linkage to uh, California. Um, uh, if you go to our um, Facebook page, we do have a Facebook that is specifically for um, Kentucky poultry. Um, we give uh, things that, you know, news that's happening, especially when avian influenza was becoming uh, an issue. And um, let me get that. Um, we post when we're having um, upcoming webinars. And um, I had a webinar, uh, not a webinar, an in person workshop come across uh, my desk that I posted on our Facebook page that um, uh, it's in uh, Eastern Kentucky, I think. Where is, um, what county was it? <laughs> the sheep guys are putting it on uh, Whitley County. That's in Eastern Kentucky, right? Yes. Williams. Southern Kentucky. It's what? Southern Kentucky. Okay, in Williamsburg, Kentucky, they're having an in-person workshop on predator uh, control. It's um, being put on by the um, the um, the sheep producers. Uh, they're having lamb for dinner for lunch. I think it's fifteen dollars. Um, we're not involved in that, but it is posted there, and it said it's sheep, but it it is. Uh, Russ says, I'm not sure if I understood on sexing the chicks. In order to vent sex, you have to evert out the, the butt of the chicken and look and see if you can see a rudimentary penis. Um, and it takes a lot of care because it's very rudimentary and you can hurt the chick if you're not careful doing it. So vent sexing requires a lot of training and expertise. And so typically hatcheries will hire vent sexing teams to come in. There are breeds that if you cross them, you can tell the males from the females on day of hatch. Those are called sex link crosses. And there are some breeds that are auto sex. That's that the males and females look different because some of their traits are linked to the sex chromosomes. And so they get a different 
look for the feathers. But in general, it is very hard to tell the difference between a male and a female on day of hatch. Any more questions? If not, we will uh, close up here. I'm just going to put my email in the chat box. If you think of a topic that you would like us to do uh, a webinar on, a series on, um, email me, let me know, and we'll see if we can get something uh, going to help you with that. So um, I will stop the recording.